We already saw that it's possible to use subclassing and inheritance to define a whole family of different specializations of one class. And hopefully you can already see the potential for this as a way of producing better abstractions. I could use this idea of a base class, of creating one single base class, one single ancestor that describes some interface, some abstraction, and then provide a whole family of different ways of implementing it. All of which, from the point of view of somebody using the base class, are the same. All of which provide the same features. Um, before I talk further about that, and before we get into things like what is the real meaning of the virtual keyword, I want I want to talk a little bit about what it means to treat an object um, uh, being of the type of the base class versus treating it as being of the type of a more specific class. So in this file, I only have two classes. I've got the fruit class, which is basically the same as it was in the previous video, and I have the raspberry class, which is also pretty much the same. I've touched it up a bit. I've sort of polished it. But the other classes from the last video are missing because I just want to talk about these two. I want to talk about a very simple class hierarchy. So all we have here is fruit, that is a base class, and then below it, um, it a, a subclass of that, a derived class of that is raspberry. And I can create objects of both type fruit and type raspberry. We'll come back later in the week to the concept that maybe if we define the base class just to be a sort of generalization, we don't want people making generic fruit. We just want them making specific ones. We will come back to that idea. Um, in this raspberry class that I have here, you'll notice I have not put the virtual keyword in front of the members of the raspberry class. And it actually turns out it's not necessary there. We do need the virtual keyword to be present to be able to override functions the way we expect them, the way we expect overriding to work. However, if the virtual keyword is present in the base class, then it's inherited. So if I have virtual in fruit, then the corresponding members of Raspberry are automatically virtual, whether I put the word virtual or not. Um, we saw already the override keyword is sort of optional. The overriding still happens without the keyword, but putting the keyword there is good error checking because if it turns out you are mistaken and this cannot be overridden, the compiler generates an error because you're saying, I think I'm overriding this. Please tell me if I'm wrong. Um, and somebody reading your code would have a better idea of what you're doing if they see that word there. Um, the Raspberry class also has a new member, one not provided by the fruit class, which is to get the number of seeds. And then it stores the number of seeds encapsulated inside of the class. This member is something fruit doesn't have. If I just have an object that's type fruit, I do not have access to this because fruit objects don't have this. Um, and then the Raspberry constructor finally sets the number of seeds. We're still using a much more primitive notation than we've been using, so we're not doing the initializer list just because we're still ramping back up. There are some implications to how you initialize things related to um, inheritance that we're going to get to later in the week. Here is the print fruit function that we had before. I'm just going to hide that prompt. Um, this is the same print fruit function. The key thing to observe is that as far as the function is concerned, the object it gets is of type fruit. That is it. It is just a fruit object. Uh, and then finally down here in main, I create fruit objects and raspberry objects. I'm going to put some space there so that not too much stuff is on the screen at once. Uh, and so as we saw in the previous video, I can make objects of type fruit, I can make objects of type raspberry, I can then call the print fruit function providing either of the two. Um, and when I'm doing that, implicitly, what the, fruit what the print fruit function is actually getting is of type fruit as far as it's concerned. The apparent type of the object from the point of view of this function is fruit. This function might know nothing about the existence of the class raspberry, much less how to work with it, but that's fine. Because I know that if I have a raspberry, every raspberry is a fruit. I'm allowed to use my raspberry object in any context I could use a fruit. Because the raspberry object has everything the fruit object does, and maybe some more. Um, we need to talk about that implicit conversion, though. When I pass an object of one type into a function, and the function receives an object of another type, what is really going on? We should be aware that converting types in C++ is a bit of a thing. We've seen over the semester, for example, last week we had to define special operators for conversion. Why is this conversion so easy? And so uh, basically, it stems from the fact that every raspberry is a fruit. And because every raspberry provides all of the functionality of a fruit, it's sort of harmless, no matter which raspberry object you're working with, to treat it like a fruit. It wouldn't do any harm to do that. And we call that upcasting. To take an object of a specialized type, a derived type, and begin treating it or, or convert it to a reference to an object of a more general type, what you're really doing is just still using the same object 
are, but you're deliberately limiting what functionality you can use. So all you're really doing is locking up certain things that are specific to raspberries. We call this an upcast. The word cast stems from the idea that we're doing a sort of type conversion, and it's called an upcast because we're walking upwards in the family tree. We're going from specific to general. Because every raspberry is a fruit, any raspberry can be upcast to fruit. We, we will assume that that operation will always succeed. It is always valid and will always succeed to perform an upcast, to work your way up the ladder of, of the class hierarchy. And of course, if you hear the term upcast, you should immediately be, be asking, okay, so clearly there's some alternative. Um, and the answer is yes. If I have a fruit object, uh, obviously, there could be lots of different subclasses of fruit. And in fact, maybe my object is literally just a fruit. That's all it is. But if I have a fruit object, for example, up here in print fruit, you give me something and tell me this is a fruit object. And uh, maybe I suspect, hey, deep down, this might just be a raspberry in disguise. It might be a raspberry that's been upcast to fruit. So the question is, is there a way I could test whether it secretly is a raspberry or whether it's something else? What we're talking about is something called downcasting, going from a general thing or trying to go from a general thing to a specific thing. The issue is, although every raspberry is a fruit and therefore upcasting is easy, it always succeeds, not every fruit is a raspberry. I could call this function five times with different fruit objects. Some of them could be raspberries, some of them might not. And so I can't assume that I can automatically convert every fruit object to a raspberry because some of them might not actually be raspberry objects. And so downcasting may not always succeed. There could be cases where it fails. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. Um, first, I wanna run this. Okay, so I print out my fruit object f. Fruit f is not a raspberry. and just prints out that it's a generic fruit and it's not delicious. Fair enough. Um, I print out my object r. The function receives an, a reference to fruit. So it does not receive a raspberry. It receives a reference to fruit. The object is just behaving as a fruit. We can think about that sort of conceptually like this. In main, my variable r has type raspberry. There it is. And its name is r. And what I'm really doing when I pass into a function is I'm sort of, if we think about, uh, I, guess, I guess I'll draw a box for main, there's main. When I think about what I'm actually doing, so here's print fruit. Well, we know how to pass references and we know, um, I'm not gonna scroll up, but take my word for it. In the function, the variable f has type fruit ampersand. So it is a, or I, I don't usually write the ampersand in the box. It is a reference to type fruit. So we color it in just like we color in a reference. It just happens that it points in, it, it, that it refers to an object of type raspberry, which is valid because the raspberry is allowed to masquerade as a fruit. It doesn't have to always exhibit all of its different behavior. A raspberry has everything a fruit has, so it's able to step into that role. It's able to pretend to just be a fruit and nothing else. Um, and maybe in print fruit, as we're going to want to do in a minute, we might want to inquire, are you actually a raspberry deep down? Can I treat you like a raspberry? Which may or may not be the case. In this case, the variable f in the function can indeed be treated like a raspberry if we know how to ask. Um, and so what I've done there is an implicit upcast. It's implicit because you don't see me saying, please convert raspberry to fruit. It's just happening automatically as I call the function. I then ask raspberry its name, and predictably I get back that its name is raspberry. We're gonna come back to these, this set of lines in a, few, in a few videos to talk about one of the pitfalls of forgetting the virtual keyword is that this behavior becomes inconsistent. Um, so on line 79, I'm performing an upcast that is explicit. I am visibly changing um, the type of something, or I'm visibly changing how I treat my variable. So in main, up until this point, I had a variable of type raspberry named R. What I'm sort of doing in main, again, using the notation we typically use for diagrams, is I'm making an object of type fruit on line number 79 that's actually just a reference, and again, deliberately limiting the scope, like what, raspberry, what the raspberry object R is willing to do. If I use R via the reference FR, it'll only do things that a fruit can do, because of course you can't use operations on an object of type fruit that aren't part of that class. But it is still the same object. R and FR are the same thing. They're just, I guess, distinguished by how they interact with the world. Um, if I use my usual notation, when I make references inside of main, I don't usually use the box. Usually I just put a second name on the variable. I could do that. I could say, well, this, this thing is also called, I'm just going to resize my, my output here. This variable is also called fr. 
but I may need to make a note that as far as uh, I'm concerned when I use fr, fr is only a fruit. So when I use fr, I can only call functions that are uh, available on type fruit. But we see in both cases, we get the version of the function in the Raspberry object, and that is thanks to the virtual keyword, and I'll come back to that. So what I want to talk about now is downcasting. You've seen two examples of upcasting, and that's not the only way of doing it. There's an even more explicit way to perform upcasting. Um, but an upcast is where you convert from a specific thing to a more general ancestor. A raspberry is a fruit, every raspberry is a fruit, and therefore I can always upcast from fruit to raspberry, from raspberry to fruit. Um, but what if I want to go from fruit to raspberry? In the print fruit function, I have no way of knowing whether what you gave me really is a raspberry, but I do have a way to ask. So I could do this. I could say raspberry ampersand r equals, well, I can't just do this. I can't just try and assign the way I would with an upcast, assign f to a reference of type raspberry ampersand. The compiler's going to say no. Absolutely not. Um, I am, however, allowed to ask the language to perform a cast. The reason why I have to ask specifically, among other things, is that this actually requires extra work. It's not as easy as another cast. When the compiler sees an upcast, like this one, the compiler doesn't need to do anything with R. It knows that whenever I get to line 80, if the variable R has type raspberry, the upcast will always succeed. Upcasts from raspberry to fruit always succeed. The problem is, on line number 54, if I give you a fruit object f, how do you know whether it's a raspberry or not? The compiler has to add some logic to go check. If I want to begin treating my fruit object as something more specific, maybe that isn't allowed. Maybe it's not really a raspberry deep down. So the compiler has to add some code in there when it compiles to verify that the object actually can be treated like a raspberry. And so we use this feature, dynamic cast. Dynamic cast is a, t C++ actually supports a variety of different named casts. The casts that we've been doing have been implicit. We've just been doing assignment statements that do type conversions. Um, that is, in a sense, a sort of uh, related to the, the way casting might work in C. And C++ also supports explicit C style casts. Um, but it, you can also use these named casts that have different meanings. Dynamic cast is what you use when any runtime checking is required. And in this case, you need to do runtime checking. For downcasting, you need to check at runtime. The compiler has to check when line 54 is run that the object you're working with right now actually is a Raspberry. And that's, that's the use of dynamic cast. <clears throat> So I convert to type raspberry ampersand, and it sort of looks like a function call. It's odd to see a function call with uh, angle brackets, but there's a reason for that. Um, and so I, I just pass in the thing that I want to convert, uh, and then I press page down by accident. Um, OK, so I've just converted my fruit object f to a raspberry object. And now to prove a point quickly, let's suppose that my program just prints out the raspberry object. Um, it's complaining that I didn't use the variable for anything, which is a good, which is a, a fair point. So maybe I'll, I'll prove once I get my raspberry object, um, uh, f is a raspberry and has, and I'll, I'll call a function that only raspberries have. So get num seeds to get the number of seeds in the raspberry. Only the raspberry type has that. So if I call that function, hopefully that's proving to you that I really do have a raspberry object. So I'll call r.getNum seeds. As of line 55, r does have type raspberry ampersand. Now this code isn't complete because we haven't handled what happens if the cast fails, which it might. But we'll just see what happens if I try running it the way it is. So in main, I'm just printing out my raspberry object. So that means that the only time I ever call print fruit, the object really is a raspberry. So this downcast should succeed. I gave it something that was a raspberry in disguise as a fruit, and I asked to convert it back. I say, I know you're secretly a raspberry. I'd like to begin treating you like one. Uh, and so we'll run it. And sure enough, the fruit is a raspberry and has six. Oh, I didn't print out seeds. OK, there we go. It's Grammatical correctness is sort of important. I'm now noticing I forgot punctuation, but we're going to have to split the difference. So f is a raspberry and has six seeds. That is the number of seeds I passed in. So it does seem as if this variable r is authentically a reference to a raspberry. But here's the problem. What if I call the function and I give it something that isn't a raspberry? So on line 69, I'm passing in an object of just type fruit. So I, I get to the function, and I, I'm giving it something of just type fruit, and then I try and jam that in and treat it like a raspberry. Well, that, that isn't going to work. It isn't a raspberry. It's something else. So if I try and cast it, that I shouldn't be allowed to do that. Uh, and if we run it, we notice that I'm not. Notice that, well, we can see that it does print out that 
it's a generic fruit and that it's not delicious. And then I get an exception. I get an exception. Well, I, I wonder what this is. STD bad cast. I think I know where the problem was. When I try and perform a downcast with the dynamic cast operator and uh, it fails, then in this case, where I'm casting from a reference to a reference, it throws an exception, which we're used to. That's the standard mode of failure for C++ that we've um, grown used to uh, idiomatically. And so if I want to test whether the object is secretly a raspberry, I can just do a try block, try the dynamic cast, and then see whether we get an instance of std bad cast. And if we do, that means I wasn't allowed to convert to a raspberry, which I think in this context means the object wasn't actually a raspberry after all. So f is not a raspberry. In this course, if you use a dynamic cast and you don't already know somehow that the object is what you're casting it to, you should always put it in a try-catch block. You should always assume that when you do a downcast, it may fail, unless you already have information to demonstrate that it will not. Um, and in general, the best way to know whether the object is a raspberry is to try a cast. There are people that sometimes try and build in some extra logic to the class that allows them to divine that separately. That is not a good idea. If you want to know whether a type can be converted, try the conversion and catch the exception. Um, so we'll try running that just to, to, to sort out that error handling case. All right, there we go. So here we are attempting a downcast via the dynamic cast operator. And if the downcast succeeds, we can then use the object that's created. If the downcast fails, we then know that it wasn't a raspberry and therefore that it would have been pointless to try and use it as one. I want to make a couple of other observations about casts. So first, you are allowed to use dynamic cast for upcasts if you want. Um, and so we'll try that. I'm going to use this dynamic cast to cast raspberry to fruit, an upcast. You don't need a dynamic cast to do that, though, because the compiler can recognize that whenever you're doing an upcast, it will always succeed. The dynamic cast operator is for the case where something might go wrong, where extra logic is needed to verify that it's valid. And so in that case, we could just write fr equals r. Um, there is an alternative that you might have assumed by now called static cast. A static cast is the cast operator in C++ that you normally use if the, the error checking needed for the cast operation can be done at compile time. In the downcast case, the error checking has to get done whenever the code runs. Because if I run the function five times, sometimes the cast may fail, sometimes it may succeed. The compiler doesn't know at compile time what the answer is going to be. With a static cast, the compiler, you can only use static cast for cases where the compiler knows in advance whether it will succeed or fail based on what it knows at the time of compilation, which is things like the types of variables. Um, and so we'll try static cast here. And we can see it works. Um, and that's because an upcast, as long as the type that you're converting is a descendant of fruit, the, the static cast, the upcast is valid. And therefore, the compiler can do all the checking it needs at compile time. Now, although I think in practice static cast is a good thing to write, in this course, because we, we do a lot of implicit conversions for other reasons that are valid, I think it's valid just to write this. But keep in mind that the, the use of dynamic cast is often specific to cases where you're downcasting. The use of static cast, or in this case, the implicit cast, the, the um, or a C-style cast would be uh, in cases where you're upcasting where there's no need to do any extra checking when you convert the object.